No, no, members, uh, <clears throat> the communication I intend to make as a bearing on uh, the document which has just been tabled, if the member for Kilivi North could uh, stop shaking hands and uh, doing jigs. The member there is, uh, is that the Honorable, Honorable Tonui? If you could take a seat, Honorable Tonui. Honorable Tonui, if you could take a seat uh, for a short while so that we can. <laughs> the member for Seme has uh, come, from, it is clear he has come from loving his lunch and uh, he did not take or partake of water. Honour members, um, this communication is a guide regarding submission of the draft election campaign financing regulations by the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission. And it relates to the paper that has just been laid before the House by the majority whip on behalf of the leader of the majority party titled the draft election campaign financing regulations and accompanying explanatory memorandum. The paper originated from the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission, the IABC. You will recall, our members, that the, the Election Campaign Financing Act of 2013 was enacted by Parliament to provide for the regulation, management, expenditure, and accountability of election campaign funds during election and referendum campaigns. The Act was suspended with respect to the 2017 general elections. Honorable members, Section 29, Subsection 1 of the said Act empowers the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission to make regulations for the better performance of its functions under this Act. The said section provides as follows, and I quote, the Commission may make regulations for the better performance of its functions under the Act, and such regulations shall be laid before the National Assembly for approval before they are published in the Gazette. In addition, on our members, Section 5 of the Act mandates the Commission to make rules to, re to regulate election campaign financing at least 12 months before the elections. And for abundance of doubt, the same section provides as follows, and I quote, the Commission shall make rules to regulate the election campaign financing, A, in the case of a general election, at least 12 months before the election, and B, in the case of a by-election or referendum, at such time as the Commission may determine. Close the quotes. Honourable members, it is important for you to note that the regulations are expected to provide for, among other things, one, the spending limits for the different elections, two, guidelines for expenditure rules for political parties and independent candidates, and three, the manner in which contributions may be made. On our members, sections 12, 18, and 19 of the Act empower the Commission to set limits for contributions and expenditures for candidates and political parties participating in an election at least 12 months before the election. Having said that, you will agree with me that uh, these are not just ordinary regulations, which may be the reason why Parliament provided that they are, they are submitted to the House in draft form for approval before they are published in the Gazette. Honourable members, <clears throat> even as the, the Election Campaign Financing Act of 2013 stipulates the timelines necessary for the approval of the same regulations, the Statutory Instruments Act provides for the ultimate process and procedure for consideration of regulations in general. In this regard, honourable members, the draft regulations and the explanatory memorandum are hereby referred to the Committee on Delegated Legislation for consideration in accordance with the law. The Committee may also undertake the necessary public engagements on the draft regulations. Given the statutory timeline set under Section 5 of the Election Campaign Financing Act 2013, I urge the Committee to expedite the process of consideration of the draft regulations and, and table its report soonest to enable the House to undertake the necessary approval processes in good time. 
the committee and indeed the entire House are accordingly guided. And I thank you, now, members. Do I see the member for Ogunja desiring to... Yes, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, you know, really, your communication is very clear. It's very unambiguous. But then, this is a matter of serious public interest. And as clearly stipulated in the Elections Financing Act, Finance Act 2013, there is a time element. But that ele time element is such that the Commission is required to have published these regulations at least 12 months before a general election. It is clear, given that today we are on the 5th of August, and the next elections, barring something else happening, is going to be on the 9th of August next year. So, Speaker, I would have wanted to hear from you, uh, uh, clarifying the public, because they are very anxious that given the time uh, uh, at which uh, these regulations have come before us as a house, and given the requirements of the, of the house in terms of dealing with them, we are not definitely going to meet the timeline for these regulations to come into force for the purposes of next uh, year's general elections. That, that should have been really helpful to, to, to relieve the, the public of the anxiety, because uh, it's very possible for busy bodies out there to start blaming Parliament for having sat on these regulations or sat the, the functions allocated to it, one of which is uh, the one of coming up with the regulations. But they have, brought them to, they have brought them to us today. In fact, was I to be minded otherwise, I would not have approved them even for tabling today. But given that uh, what you just saying that it is it is important that uh, everybody in the country knows it is not parliament it is the iabc which has sat on it on its rollers and has not pro has not presented to this house the regulations this house still as you know has the power to make and then make laws so our committee is at liberty to, pro to, to give us whatever recommendations they deem fit and necessary in the circumstances of the case. So that, and it's, it's fair that uh, since they have come today, and uh, somebody was suggesting that uh, can the Parliament pass them before Monday 9th? I said, uh, we, Parliament is also not a miracle worker. Parliament will sit up to the close of business today, fifth. I, I mean, unless somebody somewhere imagines that, uh, or maybe because they see members of parliament in all manner of functions 24-7, they imagine that even when you are supposed to be in your place of worship for our brothers and sisters who are Muslims, and for the rest of you who may be SDAs on Saturdays and others on Sundays, they think you should also be passing laws around that time. Because I can't, I can't imagine, one cannot understand how anybody in their right minds can sit on such important regulations and come bring them to Parliament on the very, very last day. But uh, without uh, making any, any, any particular determination, uh, our committee is uh, a committee of this House, and the House is at liberty to deal with the regulations, the draft regulations as they find um, appropriate. I don't seem to see the chair of the committee, the Honorable Kamket. The Honorable Kamket, the vice chair, the Honorable Jagagwa, an active member of the committee, the Honorable Angari. Please, we don't, don't comment, otherwise people may see me may think that you are prejudiced, as uh, they may think uh, the Honorable Andai may have been. But it was just drawing the attention of the House to the fact that these, re these draft regulations are coming really too late, yet they are so important. And, uh, but you know, the House, in excess of its powers, deferred the application of the Act 
from the 2017 uh, general elections. So I'm not saying much. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the House uh, will be able to deal. You make, you make the law. You, make, you can even unmake that one. Yes. And I'm sure there are very many bills here which are coming to repeal other existing laws. So let's, let's, uh, let's just proceed. The committee will give us a report. But please move with speed so that there, there is no, this, the presence of these regulations in the House does not, continue, does not elicit a necessary anxiety from um, amongst uh, other Kenyans who may be interested in the elections, uh, particularly how they are financed. Honorable Andai, Chair of Public Accounts Committee. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the following paper on the table of the House. Uh, today, Thursday, August 5th, 2021, a report of the Public Accounts Committee on the procurement of external audit services for the Office of the Auditor General for the financial years 2018-2019 and 2019-2020. Thank you. Honorable Kosing. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. And Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the House today, Thursday, August 5th, 2021, afternoon sitting. Reports of the Departmental Committee on Transport, Public Works and Housing on its consideration of the, of the following. One, the National Construction Authority Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 45 of 2020. And Honorable Speaker Number 2, the Kenya Roads Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 13 of 2021. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Chair, uh, Department of Committee on Labor and Social Welfare. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the House. Today, Thursday, August 5th, 2021, afternoon session. Or afternoon sitting. Report of the Departmental Committee on Labor and Social Welfare on its consideration of, one, the Social Assistant Repeal Bill, Bill Number 16 of 2020, and the Children Amendment Bill, Bill Number 46 of 2020. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. The chair, the chairperson, uh, finance and planning. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the House today, Thursday, August fifth, twenty twenty-one. Reports of the F Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning on its consideration of one, the Pensions Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number Twenty-Six of Twenty Twenty the Public Procurement and Assets Disposal um, Amendment Bill, National Assembly, Bill Number 34 of 2023, the Public Finance Management Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 39 of 2020, four, the Kenya Deposit Insurance Amendment Bill 2020, National Assembly Bill Number 43 of 2020, five, the Central Bank of Kenya Amendment Bill National Assembly Bill Number 47 of 2020. Six, the Public Procurement and Assets Disposal Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 49 of 2020. Seven, the Central Bank of Kenya Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 10 of 2021. Eight, the Trustees Perpetual Succession Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 23 of 2021. Nine, the Perpetuities and Accumulations Amendment Bill. 2021 National Assembly Bill Number 24 of 2021. I thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, the Chairperson, Departmental Committee on Health. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the House today, Thursday, August 5th, 2021, afternoon sitting. Reports of the Departmental Committee on Health 
on the consideration of the National Hospital Insurance Fund Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 21 of 2021, two, the Health Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 14 of 2021, three, the Pharmacy and Poisons Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 1 of 2021, four, the Community Health Workers Bill, National Society of 2020, and five, the Radiographers Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 47 of 2019. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on our members, uh, I hope we are, all, we are all paying attention. And um, I think it will be in order for the House to appreciate those committees which have been able to table reports relating to a total of 18 bills, many of which belong to individual uh, private members. And therefore, it means uh, we, we need to begin to, to consider them and possibly allocate, uh, try to, to limit time so as to be able to fast track uh, many of the private members' bills um, you know, as appropriate. I think I wish to recommend those committees. Finance, nine, nine bills. Health, five bills. Transport, two bills. And uh, labor, two bills. That is indeed commendable. And I wish to urge uh, other committees who have uh, bills to also expedite their consideration and the table the reports. Uh, even as I say this, I'm aware that when I look to my right, I know the member for NDBS has persistently been uh, uh, asking about uh, his bill. It's before the Committee of Health, isn't it? Uh, Honorable Sabina Chege, uh, that bill brings um, bring some reports. You have done very well with this. Bring some report one way or other, let the House uh, deal with it. Yeah? Please, because the Honorable Dr. Pukose has really, he's really been pressurizing even the House Business Committee. And I think uh, it's only fair that uh, the bill gets uh, the light to see the light of day. Honorable Kaki, Nyamai. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to to raise a concern, I would like first of all to con congratulate my colleagues who, are who have tabled many, many bills, reports for bills and other issues within their committees. Honorable Speaker, as you are aware, the Departmental Committee on Lands receives many petitions and uh, you did uh, grant us leave and ordered that we make sure that we deliver uh, our pending business within our committees and you gave us timelines. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we worked last week with the Departmental Committee uh, on Lands and we were able to finalize uh, three petitions. And when I asked this morning, I was told by the clerk, uh, the senior clerk of my committee, that these reports are going through uh, quality control. Honorable Speaker, I wanted to seek your direction. How long does it take? Because the next thing, Honorable Speaker, is that members will raise on the floor of the House asking about the petitions that they are brought to the departmental committee. We did conclude three in Mombasa and this morning we worked on two. So we, were, we are working very hard. So I would like to seek your direction on how long does it take for these uh, quality control departments to work on uh, our reports so that I also table, so that also the members of departmental committee on lands who have been working very hard do not think that uh, the reports are not being tabled. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I think that's a matter that uh Mr. Kirui and the clerk should address. Whatever, whatever the case, they, they should be ready. But uh, quality control uh, should not um, also delay presentation of reports. It's good that you've raised that issue, Rachel. Order number six. On, on next order. Sorry. Order number six, notices of motion. Uh, Honorable Wandai. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I beg to give notice of the following motion. That this House adopts the report of the Public Accounts Committee 
on procurement of external audit services for the Office of the Auditor General for the financial years 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 laid on the table of the House on Thursday, August 5th, 2021. And pursuant to Article 226, sub-Article 4 of the Constitution and Section 43 of the Public Audit Act Number 35 of 2015 approves the appointment of MS Ronalds Limited Liability Partnership to audit the accounts of the Office of the Auditor General for the financial years 2018-2019 and 2019-2020. Thank you. Next order. Order number seven, questions and statements. First, first question by the member. Go to se first segment. Member for Mwingi Central. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise to ask uh, question number 265 of 2021 to the Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Education. Number one. Could the cabinet secretary provide the current ratio of teacher, teachers to pupils for primary and secondary schools in Mwingi Central constituency vis-a-vis -vis the recommended ratio as stipulated in the education policy? Number two, could the CS provide the current total number of teachers in Mwingi Central constituency in both primary and secondary schools vis-a-vis -vis the total number required? Number three, what measure the ministry put in place to improve the performance and quality of education in the constituency, which has largely been compromised by the shortage of teachers? Number four, considering that uh, Mwingi Central constituency is currently experiencing drought following the failure of long, long rains, could the ministry provide free school feeding program to schools in the constituency with a view to ensuring that children attend school. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Question will be replying to before the Departmental Committee on Education and Research. Next question by the member for Ganze. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have the pleasure to ask question number 267 of 2001, direct to the Cabinet Secretary for Education and uh, Research. Roman 1, could the Cabinet Secretary explain why Ngamani Primary School in Jaribuni Ward, Ganza constituency is managed through Kilifi sub-county as opposed to Kauma sub-county where it falls administratively? Roman 2, could the Cabinet Secretary outline the measures the Ministry has put in place to address infrastructural and management challenges currently facing the said school? Mr. Speaker, I beg to bring to your attention that uh, in Roman 1, there was a typo error whereby they had indicated Kauma County, but, uh, but it is Kuala uh, County, but it is Kauma Sub County. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. To be replied to before the Committee on Education and Research. Next question by the member for Sirisia. Honorable Aluke. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise to ask uh, question number 270 uh, of 2021 to the Cabinet uh, Secretary for Education. One, could the Cabinet Secretary explain how the government plan uh, to realize 100% transition for all students who sat for for the 2021 Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education, KCSE, examination to universities, colleges, and other institutions of high learning, as directed by His Excellency the President, Uhuru Kenyatta. Two, will the Cabinet Secretary also explain how all the 143,140 students 
who attained grade C plus and above. Grade C, C plane, and many opt out to join other institutions of learning, such as technical and vocational education training, TVET institution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question will be replied again before the Departmental Committee on Education and Research. Next question is by the member for Gilgil, Honorable Wangari. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to ask question number 275 of 2021 to the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure, Housing, and Urban Development and Public Works. Number one, what steps is the Ministry taking to ensure that the 15-kilometer section of the road between Gilgil Town and Kanyeriri Center on the Gilgil, the right, the right uh, name of the road, Mr. Speaker, is Gilgil to Maini in Gilgil constituency that was left incomplete during the rehabilitation of the Gilgil to Maini is constructed to completion. Number two, could the Cabinet Secretary state the expected commencement and completion date of the project? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question will be replied to before the Department of Committee on Transport, Public Works and Housing. Next question by the member for Dagureti North, Honorable Simba Arati. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask a question 286 of 2021 to the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure, Housing and Urban Development and Public Works. One, Mr. Speaker, could the Cabinet Secretary explain the policy measures with respect to the maximum numbers of residential apartments, units, and the floors which may be developed within in the area within Nairobi City, where parcel land LL number 209-3289, measuring 0.3661 acre, is located. To Chair, uh, Mr. Speaker, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether the ongoing development on the said parcel of land has fully complied with all regulations and procedure, including zoning limits, in line with the Fiscal Planning, planning and Land Use Planning Act 2019, approval of National Construction Authority, and the certification with respect to environmental and impact assessment. Three, Mr. Speaker, what measures has the ministry taken to stop the ongoing development on the said land or property given the complaints raised by the residents and the property owners in the neighborhood with respect to adherence to the Fiscal and Land Use Planning Act 2019 and EI? which is undertaken and approved in accordance with the law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To be replied to before the Department of Committee on Transport, Public Works and Housing. The next question is by the member for Igembe Central, Honorable Kubai. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to ask question number 288 of 2021, directed to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, for interior and the coordination of national government. Mr. Speaker, number one, could the Cabinet Secretary outline the measures the Ministry has put in place to urgently stem the rampart cases of insecurity in the Egembe Central constituency occasioned by innovations and attacks by armed raiders allegedly from the neighboring Isiolo region, who on 28th of July 
2021 caused the death of four persons, residents of Ntukai village. There's a typing error there, Mr. Speaker. It's Ntukai village and stole property of unknown value. Number two, could the cabinet secretary provide the measures it has put in place to disarm the sand raiders and apprehend criminals who have been attacking innocent civilians as they attempt to protect their property and, uh, uh, and the farms? Three, could the cabinet secretary also provide the steps the ministry is taking to stop illegal grazers from invading private farms and destroying crops in the charge of pasta for their animals? And finally, Mr. Speaker, could the cabinet secretary consider compensating the victims of these attacks, uh, uh, attacks for the losses they have suffered in terms of loss of lives, medical expenses, funeral expenses, and loss, loss of farm produce? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question will be replied to before the Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security. At the end of the first segment, what the second segment is responses to re statement requests. And the first uh, response is by the Chairman, Departmental Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Honorable Judge Uganya, you are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I respond on behalf of the chairman of the committee. The response is the statement by the Honorable John Mulua, MP, regarding human wildlife conflict in the Voy constituency. Honorable Speaker, the member of Voy constituency, John Mulua, MP, sought for a statement regarding human wildlife conflict in the Voy, pursuant to Standing Order 42C. He specifically raised the following concerns in the statements he called for. One, what measures are being taken to bring human wildlife conflict in the very constituency, particularly in Bololo, Ngoli locations, as well as Kasigao, Machienye, Marungu, and Lower Sagala areas to an end. <coughs> Two, what measures are being taken to compensate families affected by this wildlife conflict in the very constituency? Three, whether the ministry could provide, could consider compensating victims of the human wildlife conflict whose claims have been pending for the last five years and when they will be paid. Honorable Speaker, the committee engaged the Minister of Wildlife and Tourism, Minister of Tourism and Wildlife, on the above concerns raised by Honorable Mulolua. I therefore wish to respond as follows. A, on the measures being taken by Kenya Wildlife Service to mitigate emerging causes of human wildlife conflict in the very constituency, the following measures have been taken by KWS to mitigate emerging cases of human wildlife conflict in the very constituency. One, ground and area patrols. KWS has been has been using mobile teams to patrol the known hotspots to avert and also to spawn to conflict areas. They have also been using aircraft to identify and map wildlife movements, especially for elephants. This has helped in driving elephants before they move to communities or other settled areas. The four mobile teams have been deployed to Kishushe, Bololo, Mbulia, Sagala, and Bogota areas of Kasigao, and are equipped with full camping gears and four by four wheel, four by four wheel drive open land cruisers. Elephants, elephants drive by use of, are driven by use of helicopters has been done in the affected areas within the constituency on diverse, on diverse deaths in the last few months. In addition, Kedos Choppers, 5YKWW, um, uh, and DCWT Chopper 7, 5YCSP for seven days, for seven day, days to drive uh, the elephants. Two, Prompt, prompt and rapid response to reported areas. K KWS has strategically placed mobile problem animal control teams at all hotspots areas for quick and prompt response to reported areas to report the case of wildlife in invading community areas. The team are also involved in assessment of farms and property destroyed by animals and issue compensation, for, compensation forms to the affected residents. The mobile teams work closely with other conservation partners and local community members to drive elephants from affected areas. They have also provided the individual private mobile numbers plus the VOI community service station hotline number to, be, to, be, to the community members for efficient communication. Number three, problematic animal, manage, problematic animal management unit. This is a special unit under KWS which offers support in key hotspot areas in the country to deal with problem animal control when conflict cases become intense. In the last two months, the team has come in very constituency to give support to resident park teams in, in handling human wildlife conflict. Four, 
community support in, in human wildlife mitigation. Kenya Wildlife Service has issued, has issued rechargeable spotlights and blow horns uh, with zealous to, to community members as a mitigation measure to help them scare away problem animals before the response teams arrive in the affected areas. Five, game proof fences. A number of fences are being put in place around the park, the park and community areas for conflict mitigation, for example, in the Mkatao fence in the Southwest National Park, in the Ikanga Voy fence in Southern East National Park, Mkatao Alia Kamutonga fence within the ranches and around Mwatete, D, the place, phase two of Mgemo, Buguta, Meaisenye fence is at the final stage, community stakeholders participation to allow for development of an environmental impact assessment document. Um, six, stakeholders and community engagement. KWS has been working closely with key, key conservation stakeholders like Save the Elephants, Charity Quality Trust, Service Trust, and, Service Trust and Wildlife Works, ensuring that communities are supported in mitigating human wildlife conflict, especially in, in the name hotspots. This includes support for conservation of wildlife proof fences, the silting of water pans and dams, enterprise places like beekeeping and sunflower farming. Regular engagement with the community have also been ongoing with the intention of creating awareness on harmonious coexistence with wildlife and to address any concern from the community in regard to human wildlife conflicts. Mr. Speaker, I'm just about to conclude. On the measures being taken to protect wildlife affected by human wildlife conflict in the very constituency, compensation uh, have been widely used in Kenya as a method of mitigating the impact of human wildlife conflict. The, the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act 2013 provides for compensation for human wildlife, human injury, livestock predation, crop destruction, and property damage cases by cause, and property damage cause cases and a definition made. The definitions and recognition of the TWCCC shall be discussed by the Ministry of Wildlife Conservation Committee and a condition made to the Commission Secretary, Minister of Tourism and Wildlife for personal approval or any other determination as the case may be. And all conferences all conflict incidences from very constituency are verified and personal forms are issued to the affected members of the community. Honorable Speaker, on the status of payment for human wildlife conflict compensation to victims of human wildlife conflicts in the Voy constituency, which have been pending for the last five years, the government, through the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife, have been releasing compensation funds for settlements of approved, of, for, of approved human wildlife conflict compensation claims across the country. A total of 437 prisoner claims for, human, for victims of human wildlife conflict from very constituency have been processed and approved for payment. Out of these, 363 claims amounted to Kenyashli, 23,878,717 were processed for payment by the end of June 2021. The balance of 75 approved claims amounted to Kenyashli, 46, 46,850,000 and 80 shillings are pending awaiting allocation of funding from national treasury. A detailed response with a list of, a detailed response with a list of 363 claims, cases for process payment, and, and those of 75 approved cases pending payment have been shared with the member. With the member. I submit and I thank the speaker for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Voy, the Honorable Mlolwa. Is it the Honorable Mulolo who requested the statement? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I've had the response, but I'm, I'm sorry it is not meeting what I had asked. Number one, most of these claims were for the year two, 2014, and most of them was, have not been paid to date. And as you are talking now, in, out there working on them, I don't, I don't want to agree with that answer. The elephants are still roaming freely in the people's farms. They are still destroying people's tanks. They are still destroying water reservoirs, and nothing much is being done on the ground. I would have expected that the committee would even suggest that they'll come down and even see what is going on on the ground, so that we're able to see and to learn from the ground the damage which is being caused by elephants and other animals in, in my area. The tanks, the water tanks which were destroyed, I had expected that those would be addressed immediately, that 
all those homes whose tanks have been destroyed, they would have been replaced by now by KWS. Finally, the last time I met the Minister for Tourism, he talked about he needed $3.5 billion to be able to pay all the compensation in the country. Can the committee ensure that they bring the budget to this parliament so that we are able to give the ministry the money to pay the human wildlife conflict people who have been affected all the years through. Mr. Speaker, it is, not, it is no longer attainable because if all these people are affected, they grow this food for subsistence, but all of it is destroyed, say from 2014. Today is 2021, they have not been compensated. I don't think that is fair and something should be done seriously. As we make the budgets for this country or for the Ministry of Tourism, it's important to put enough money so that these people can be compensated. And not only in Voyo Taita Taveta, I think this affects the whole country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Chaju. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I do appreciate Mr. Mulolo's uh, concerns on this. Mr. Speaker, sir, under your leadership in the in 11th Parliament, we passed Wildlife Living Conservation Act of 2013. We clearly ensured that there will be enough compensation for all forms of injury, including human death, even to uh, humans and even for crops damaged in their farms. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is this house which is, gives money. As a committee on environment, we are extremely frustrated when all our colleagues raise these very important questions, and we know they are truly deserving, but we are not able to get the necessary funds from this house to be able to deal conclusively with this issue of wildlife human conflict. Mr. So Speaker, the law, we have passed the law. Mr. So Speaker, sir, we pay up to six million in terms of human, human, human death, and equally for other damages. But Mr. Speaker, sir, Treasury is not able to give the amount of money required. Even this year, what we pass is very insignificant in terms of raising the millions of outstanding Jews. I call upon my colleagues here because we are all affected by this serious concern um, of human wildlife conflict, whereby people are killed, they have to wait for payment for over six years or even ten years, Mr. Speaker, sir. We have the powers of the past. Please support us as a community of environment. Let's have the funding that we require so that we Can, for, for, for once, for, for house, so that these Kenyans who have suffered so much are able to be compensated. And Mr. Speaker, sir, that power is with us in this house. Let's make a decision and a determination once and for all, even if it's a supplementary budget. Mr. Speaker, sir, not even more than, even maybe in, uh, 20 billion to say, the, to say the least, so that we are able to deal with this issue once and for all. There are Kenyans who have been waiting for the compensation for the last 10 years, Mr. Speaker, sir. It's not fair. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, the power is in your hands. See what to do. There's not a lament that uh, uh, the, the constituents are not being uh, compensated, yet we have the power of the past. The next uh, request is by the Honorable Duale, the Chair of Finance. I don't see the Honorable Duale present today. Yeah, so, so Honorable Speaker, the Honorable Duale is, is, is not present. Present, but since uh, we we did this together, we invited him to the committee so that he could uh, engage with the Capital Markets Authority himself, in you know, together with the members of the committee. So the response that we will give is uh, a matter that we have discussed. So what I will do is maybe not read the entire report. I'll just highlight what his question was and what our conclusions are, and then maybe table it, and then we can move forward with your permission, Honorable Speaker. Proceed. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. 
Pursuant to standing order 442C, Honorable Aden Dwale requested for a statement on Wednesday, 23rd June 2021, regarding Capital, Mo Capital Markets Authority. Uh, capital markets regulatory failures and oversighting, oversight leading to losses of investors' funds. He sought for responses to the following issues. The to one is the total number of all the unregulated capital markets products in the effectiveness and efficiency of CMA in regulating the capital markets in Kenya, and the total number of firms penalized by CMA in the last five years and remedial action which was taken for investors who lost Funds. So, Honorable Speaker, we held a, the committee held a, a meeting on Thursday 8th, July 2021, and the Chief Executive Officer of CMA, Mr. Wycliffe Shamia, responded to the issues raised as appear in this statement. So, the statement highlights all the issues that were raised and what their responses were. But, uh, by and large, the CMA said that, uh, told the committee that CMA has built a reputation of uh, efficiently and effectively discharging its objectives as required by uh, the CMA Act. Consequently, the authority has been recognized as the most innovative capital markets regulator in Africa five times in a row, 2014 to 2019. And it is also through their good work that the authority has been recognized through key appointments to the Board of International Organization of Securities and Commissions, among other things that they said. But finally, the answers were not sufficient. So in conclusion, Honorable Speaker, from the responses provided by CMA, the committee established that there are more issues that needed to be inquired into. For instance, members noted that the CMA Act needs to be amended in order to enable the authority to discharge its mandates effectively. In addition, the committee was of the view that the matter regarding the of Imperial Bank and Chase Bank needed to be addressed more comprehensively as the primary regulator CBK undertook to furnish the committee with the preliminary findings of the forensic audit carrying out following the collapse of the said banks. With regards to the Cyton Investments Group, the committee noted the need to engage the investors who funds, whose funds were allegedly were alleged to have been lost and further engage the management of the investment group. It is for the above reasons, therefore, that the committee is seeking the leave of the House to carry out a comprehensive inquiry on this matter and table its recommendations with a view of ensuring that Kenyans who lost their investments in the capital markets are duly compensated and to prevent future loss. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Very well. But to the extent that the committee seeks leave, the only way it can get that leave is through a motion. So maybe, Honorable Wanga, you may, you may consider um, your committee sitting and uh, approving a motion to, to that, uh, to that extent, I mean, to express uh, the, con the conclusions of you you've read out. Well advised, Honorable Speaker. Next response, Chair Health. You have uh, three responses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, the first response, uh, I'll take some time, but the second two responses, uh, the members had appeared before the committee and um, they indicated they were satisfied unless they have any other response. So I'll just touch on the, those two later, but I'll start with the first one. It was a statement, request for statement regarding operation of buses during the COVID-19 pandemic in the country by Honorable Abu Ahmad Sharif Nasir, MP Mvita constituency. And the question was, um, could the chair explain the basis of, for allowing rail and road transport to carry passengers at full capacity during the period of COVID-19 pandemic while subjecting cost public services buses totaling to 1,260 buses operated by 42 companies to operate at half capacity. Um, the response was following the development of protocols for the resumption of air and rail transport in July 2020. This mode of transport resumed their operations with their full capacity in August 2020 and October 2020 respectively. 
and this resumption revelated on the ability of the stakeholders to adhere to the containment measures uh, detailed in the protocols. This is made possible owing to the inherent strict procedures guiding the booking, ticketing on board and seating arrangements in these two modes of transport. It's also leveraged on thorough screening at the passengers, especially temperature screening at the several points before boarding, aimed at limiting the entry of suspected cases in the cabin. In the response to the direction given by the HE, the President in the 14th Presidential Address to the Nation on COVID-19 Pandemic on 12 March 2021, the Ministry of Health, together with the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Interior, the Federation of Public Transport Sector, and other state departments, including the Kenya Revenue Authority, National Transport Safe Authority, Safety Authority, held a joint meeting and reviewed the existing protocols in the transport sector and agreed to a new guidelines to be complied with the, with the PSV industry. The protocols were reviewed to, among other things, to allow PSV to carry full capacity subject to enhancement of safety measures and safe regulation through the PSV circles and companies to facilitate continued safety for passengers while mitigating the spread of COVID-19. However, the protocol could not be implemented as the positivity rate in the country began to rise from a low positivity of 2% in January to the, posi the positivity rate increased to 26.6 in the fourth week of March 2021, while indications on rise were on a rising rate. The herald, the beginning, this era, the beginning of the third wave of pandemic. The country is only emerging from the third wave, but the pandemic has not relented yet. In order to achieve full implementation of the protocol, where the public transport operators uh, were, requir were required to collaborate, with NT to collaborate with the NTSA, the National Police Service, and other public transport stakeholders to ensure full compliance with the protocols. The Ministry of Health is currently working with the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Transport to map out mechanisms to ensure compliance with the protocols. Such mechanisms include the engagements with the circles to regulate the road transport operations uh, of the operator registered under them. It is the hope that the ministry, um, that the PSVs will be able to resume the full load carrying capacity of the country emerges from the current wave of the pandemic, bearing in mind that uh, they need to still follow the wearing of the mass sanitizing and having washing points. Mr. Speaker, if I'm just to add something, I am uh, informed that um, both the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Transport have agreed that the PSVs can resume to the full capacity and they are waiting for the NTSA. And I was hoping maybe by this week or next week, they can quickly uh, have that meeting with the stakeholders and this can be fully be implemented. On the second question was about the consider could the chairperson consider reviewing the COVID-19 protocols and guidelines with regard to the buses, considering that the bus companies are currently operating at half capacity and running into roses in particular if they can be allowed to operate on 24-hour basis? And um, I request that I don't go through um, the response, but it's similar to the first question, that the matter is already being discussed by various departments, and hopefully this can be resolved um, within maybe two weeks' time. On the third question, could the chairperson consider reviewing the COVID-19 protocols on the banning night travel using buses as compared to night travels allowed on standard gauge railway, which operate on full capacity despite the night curfew imposed for more than a year? The response was the dusk to dawn curfew has been in fact for more than a year with periodic adjustment to the time it commences and ends each day. The hours operations of the standard uh, gauge railway are arranged so that journeys undertaken in the SDR are, at, are times to begin and, and end outside the curfew timings. Notably, SGR operates express service during the curfew hours. The ministries of transport, health and interiors are working on mechanisms that will allow the inter-county buses to commence and end their journeys outside the curfew hours. One of the options is, is for... Is for would be to ensure that the buses operate only express services to avoid drop-off within the curfew hours. On question four, could the chair explain why the protocol for public road transport operation adopted in preparing for the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions has not been implemented as assigned by the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure, Housing and Urban Development and Public Works uh, in February 2020? 
Um, the response again mirrors to the first response. And um, we are hoping that within um, this week and next week, this can be sorted out because the whole matter was left with NTC, NTSA and specifically there were some things that the, the DG NTSA was supposed to implement, having consulted with the circles. I want to table that answer. Mr. Speaker, I don't know whether I should go to the second and third, then the members can, will we first allow to give comments? You could allow the member from Vita to... That's okay. Yeah, Thank Honorable you. Sharif. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, um, I had a word with the chair, and she's in agreement with me that these responses are truly not satisfactory at all. Mr. Speaker, we're dealing with human lives. Mr. Speaker, it's a known fact that in this country, over the last three months, there have been 483 suicide cases that have been reported. 483 suicide cases. More people are literally losing their livelihood from the effects of these lockdowns and these operations that the government has been able to put into place than even COVID itself. 483 people, Mr. Speaker, and not even a single one of us here will deny that right now, joblessness is at its highest in this country. No, none of us will deny here that every single day they receive phone calls from their constituents that people are being sent home because of lack of school fees. No one here is going to deny, Mr. Speaker, that crime has increased to the extent that people are bold enough to actually attack police officers and stations. No one here is going to deny, Mr. Speaker, divorce rate as well is amongst the highest. We are breaking families. Mr. Speaker, look at the responses that the government has been able to give. It's so wanting. One, they're saying in their first response, and I want to read what has actually been read out. Verbatim, following the development of protocols for the resumption of air and rail transport in July, this mode of transport resumed the operations with their full carrying capacity in August 2020 and October 2020, respectively. And question is, why can these same protocols be used on the buses as well? An institution that is currently hiring close to 6,000 people directly, and if we look at the indirect employment that, is, that, that people are actually losing out, it's a multiple effect, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you go on even further. Response number three, actually I want to still go on. In order to achieve full implementation of the protocols, the public transport operators are required to collaborate with the NTSA. They have collaborated with the NTSA. The NTSA is aware that the bus owners have been able to do this. No one can tell me right now that no bus owner can be able to put a thermogun for people to be able to measure the temperature of a passenger. No one can be able to tell me, Mr. Speaker, that we cannot have sanitizers in buses. No one can be able to tell me, Mr. Speaker, equally, that we cannot have direct stop from one point to the other, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it's a bit scary as well they are aware, they are aware that these protocols are in place. They've even said it, that the Federation of Public Transport together with the Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Interior, and other state departments, including KRA, NTSA, and uh, Safety Authority, reviewed these existing protocols from March 2021. March, Mr. Speaker. March, April, May, June, July, August. Six months down the line. And nothing has been done. And yet here we are getting saddened by the state at which this country is moving. And if people are not going to be able to take action, Mr. Speaker, we are going to lose out on this country. Every single Kenyan is looking at every one of you who is here to be able to come up with solutions. And what is happening, instead of government coming up with solutions, Mr. Speaker, the same government 
that is meant to enhance the livelihood of people, the same government is continuously stamping its foot down on the lives of Kenyans. And if we don't say this, this will be the highest level of betrayal on the people who voted for us, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the chair has talked about that within a period of two months, two weeks, that something is going to be able to be done. I'm expecting, Mr. Speaker, you know, I was truly expecting that the Ministry of Health, in its principles of guiding matters to do with, you know, the protocols and the guidelines, as envisaged in the constitution of this country, as are stated in the laws of this country, Mr. Speaker, we're expecting them to come and tell us something like, we're talking to the bus owners and their airlines and as Mr. Speaker, we, I mean, here we are, and every single day, we simply have to say that government has requested for two weeks, government has requested for an extra three weeks, and every hour that passes, Mr. Speaker, and we don't provide solutions, every hour, forget about the weeks that we are talking about, every hour that we don't provide solutions, we are killing our own. You know, you know you, you, you appear to have uh, forgotten. It's not debate. No, no, no. There's no comment. There's no comment. No, no, no. It is, it is, it is not in your purview to, to make that determination. We, we, we need to get to business. We need to get to business. We have a number of questions that need to be put. It's not life and death. But when you get one minute, Honorable Pukose, on the same one. Yes. This is Honorable Rono, yes. Honorable Speaker, what Honorable Abdul Samat has asked is a very serious matter because it affects the business and life loads of many Kenyans. And I would ask uh, if it is possible that the chair seeks a better response from the ministry because what the ministry has actually given is inadequate. We need to see a progress on how these people are going to get, how we can be able to prevent COVID at the same time allow people even to travel. We could even introduce that everybody who travels on the buses must be vaccinated. That way it makes, allows this These people, in a way, we could also be promoting vaccination within our country. Honorable Rono. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. I only wanted to comment on one thing, Honorable Speaker, because I, I, I feel the pain of Honorable Nasir, which we do also feel, because it affects uh, our membership a lot. Uh, when I take a plane to Eldred, to Mombasa, and so forth, we sit next to each other. And it's a very interesting thing. I am just wondering whether uh, planes are, 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 are not uh, corona, uh, uh, they, 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 they don't get corona. When you sit in a plane, you don't get corona. But when you sit in a bus, you can get corona. It, it's a very interesting uh, scenario. If we have allowed the, 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 the plane transport, the air transport, for, to carry full capacity. It's only fair that we allow the buses, the matatus, to carry full capacity. Honorable Undo. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I join with the pain of uh, my, my colleague. The statement from the ministry is underwhelming and not 
capable of answering the issues at hand. The ministry seems to be providentially ostrich, burying its head under the sun, knowing that everything is okay, yet Kenyans are, are suffering. Honorable Speaker, the transport industry is a major employer. Those who are unable to operate full capacity are suffering. The social impact is overwhelming. It's more than the impact of the corona itself. Honorable Speaker, the owners of those transport vehicles have taken loans. They are choking. Honorable Speaker, I think at some point, the ministry and the government as a whole needs to be sympathetic to the plight of Kenyans. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Russell. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, when the country closes down, uh, something should be done. Are we vaccinating? Are we fumigating? What is it that we are doing so that uh, the transport system goes back uh, in the ordinary? We associate ourselves with the concern of Honorable Nasir. I think he is not alone. All the members sitting in the August House are concerned that wherever the government closes down anything, so long as vaccination is not going on, it is a zero a sum game that we are not gaining anything in return. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I empathize with the Honorable Nazir, and indeed it's true. Many entrepreneurs, Mr. Speaker, are really suffering. If you have your transport industry, Mr. Speaker, and the capacity has been reduced, it minimizes your chance to break even. And if you cannot break even, Mr. Speaker, that means the business is going to collapse. And as the business collapses, Mr. Speaker, there are those people who have employed, the drivers, the conductors, are likely to lose their jobs. We humbly request the government, Mr. Speaker, to look for measures that can help to cushion these farmers. But particularly the CS from the response it has given, Mr. Speaker, I think it's the highest time it should be summoned. And if a CS in one way or another does not give us a satisfactory answer, Mr. Speaker, we should impeach God ruled about this matter. So Parliament, Mr. Speaker, represents the representative of the people. The sovereign power belongs to the people, Mr. Speaker, which can be exercised directly or indirectly by the democratically elected leaders who are members of this House. Way forward, Mr. Speaker, I think you should give a thorough warning that CSS, wherever they are, they should not take serious, they should not take this House for granted, Mr. Speaker. And we must start with this matter that Honorable Hasir Nazir has brought on board. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Kangogo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Nasir has just singled out the transport sector, which is very important and uh, employing many Kenyans. Mr. Speaker, other sectors like the hospitality industry, they are suffering the same. The government, uh, they are uh, uh, close to the country, there is a lockdown everywhere, and they are not giving alternatives on how these people can be cushioned. Mr. Speaker, the former ones who, have, who just joined a school some days ago, there are so many of them who have not been able to be admitted to Form 1 because their parents, uh, who used to work as conductors, who used to work as drivers, cannot take their children to school, Mr. Speaker, because of that uh, issue of uh, the buses being locked out, they are carrying just a half of, of their capacity. Mr. Speaker, the answers given from the ministry, they are so shallow, and it's like they don't have, you know, that pain of that... Uh, person who has been employed in that sector. Mr. Speaker, I think you, it is high time even yourself, Mr. Speaker, you intervene, you ask the chair to bring a comprehensive and a solution to this. Honorable Mohammed Mahmoud Sheikh. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think uh, although this is not being debated, but uh, it is important that we do contribute to uh, important factual matters important factual matters is that unless we get herd immunity in this country, unless we have got people who are vaccinated, unless we have got people who are exposed but are able to be able to defend themselves naturally, then it becomes a challenge. It becomes a challenge and it's a challenge that we all need to uh, consider that there are ways that we can get out of it. The best way we can get out of it is to have the entire population vaccinated or at least at a threshold where we can be able to be comfortable to say that uh, these should, be, should suffice uh, to be able to protect our people. Unless that happens, we will have this challenge continuously. But we also need to meander through this. 
by ensuring that we provide better abilities, providing masks, sanitations, and all these things, and transport to continue, and life to continue. That's all I want to add. Now, Honorable Mele. Honorable Speaker, the issues that have been raised by Honorable Abdul Samad Nasir are very vital. And I want to ask the Chair Health actually to take it uh, back to the CS to know very well that every other sector, if it is closed, is not a solution. Every other time, and there's a, there's a very simple thing, uh, Honorable Speaker, here. If, for example, the government have one million doses, for example, to vaccinate people, and in the, in the Matatu sector, why don't they have in every stage across the country people who are supposed to do that job? Because at times the number of Kenyans who travel are almost the same because these are businessmen, these are people who are taking students to school, these are people who are running up and down. But if you are going to close for, for a tout, what is, what is this alternative? It is to steal. If you are going to close for a tout, what is this alternative? You will commit crime and all these other activities. So I want to ask the CS and the Ministry of Health to come out very clearly on COVID so that actually we have had the new immunity and uh, we save our people. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Finally, Andagala. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I also want to uh, give my voice on this uh, pandemic issue, the issue Honorable Nasir put across to say the truth, Mr. Speaker, the Kenyans are suffering. This COVID thing is devastating. I think the best thing to do to be done by the minister or the minister of health should devise a method of making sure every Kenyan is vaccinated. Once every Kenyan is vaccinated, so that we go back to our normal lives, we may be putting on this uh, we may be closing our mouth and nose every now and then. We wash our hands. We keep distance. That will make us move as a country. Because the economy, economy is down. Many people are dying. Families don't have food on their table. The situation is there. We need a solution to all this, to heal this country. It's high time the ministry should take the necessary precaution and ensure through the government, every Kenyan is vaccinated. Now, honor members, uh, remember this is a, a request. This, this was a request for a statement. The issues you've raised are quite uh, pertinent, but uh, they are coming at a time when you, you know you. You, you, you wanted to, to be allowed to make some comments and express your anger and frustration and uh, commiserations with those that have lost their loved ones. But that's about all. You members, as members, know how best to deal, uh, to compel action. And I want to encourage you, including the Honorable Abdul Samad, Even if it has to come through a committee, if you can propose uh, some um, motion where the House is able to resolve in a particular way, including having to call the Cabinet Secretary for Health alongside the Cabinet Secretary for Transport to appear before, before the committee, so that uh, certain decisions can be made, can be taken, where a report will be tabled here, debated, and uh, possibly adopted as a resolution, which then could uh, give you the teeth with which to bite. Don't, I, mean, I think it's not fair for the, member, for the House to all the time express frustration. Earlier on, when the Honorable Chachu Ganya uh, uh, read the statement about uh, you know compensation. The member for Voy, the Honourable Lola, was just lamenting 
So he said, for how long are we going to lament? I think um, we better think of uh, ways of uh, getting action. And that can be through motions. And if you bring appropriate motions, we will prioritize them. Suspend other business, start to de debate those issues, and uh, resolve in a particular way, from which now you, you're going to be able to, you know, to hold other people accountable. Because now this thing, of the, the statement is not uh, sufficient, the answer is not uh, is shallow, yeah, but it, the, end, it only ends there with the uh, lamentation. I think uh, as a house we shouldn't be lamenting. Honorable Sabina, you wanted to, don't express frustration <laughs> as a chair. Yes. yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, Mr. Speaker, I, I also happened that last week when I met more than 30 chairs of the circles. And what members have expressed here is a true reality. Majority of those matatus are on loans and they take care of many families, whether be it the drivers or the conductors, the effect that the matatu industry, not just the buses that the honorable member had, uh, had raised, actually the entire public service uh, vehicles. This matter needs to be addressed. I actually went ahead, Mr. Speaker, to reach out to the Minister of Transport and uh, also our minister. And only that they, were, they, they, they had a very busy schedule, we were hoping that we could have had a meeting with them to sort out this matter. That's why I made a commitment. Mr. Speaker, as a chair, I want to make a commitment, even if it makes, takes my committee to invite all those CSAs, plus the NTSA, because it seems all the protocols were agreed, but the ball is uh, lying at the NTSA court. So we'll take up the matter as a members of the health committee, we'll invite the honorable member, and there were other members who had also asked a similar question so that we make sure that we save the public sector, the, the, the public sector, and especially the, pri the private sector on the matatu, especially on the matatus and the buses. So as members are getting frustrated, there's some hope. And I'm hoping the next two weeks we can have a better report to table in this house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, and I think uh, just to encourage you, invite all those uh, stakeholders, the, those in the public transport uh, sector, plus the regulatory authorities, the NTSA and uh, what other, what, whatever other agencies, and the peoples. Unfortunately, some of them, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap about where they, rep they are reporting uh, places. But if they, if they tell you that they report to the interior, invite also the interior, so that this matter can be, you know, it's like for the benefit of Kenyans. It's not, it's not a loving matter. Let be, and, and there was a very good proposal from what the Honorable Pukosa said. Yes, because you, you should encourage vac people to be vaccinated. But uh, you also must take, uh, take, take, take some initiative, know where the people are. And if they're in the transport uh, sector, take, take, take it there. So they shouldn't, they shouldn't uh, uh, I see the, the, the chair of uh, transport. Uh, no, it's not, we're not talking about uh, <laughs> just the transport sector, but the concerns that have been raised by members here, that uh, some of the protocols agreed on are not being uh, implemented. And I think, uh, Honorable Sabina Cheke, you, if you could uh, arrange <clears throat> and invite as many on the day, and uh, I'd, I'd already encourage that uh, there be some notices, including at the entrance of which committee is meeting where and about what. I don't know why it, it, it's not there, because it is important on, on a meeting like that, in a meeting like that one, it's important that as many members as possible uh, are made aware so that they can attend. Uh, let's get as many ideas coming uh, being be coming to the table as possible, so that uh, you know, some uh, firm decision in the interest of uh, the country can be can be reached. And so I think, Honorable Sabina, when you call the meeting, please notify. Just just get the clerk. The clerk should notify members on that particular. This so that as many members as possible can attend. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious matter. 
You had some other response, Honorable Sabina. Did you say you had already discussed with the members? Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, we had the request for statement by Honorable Gideon Kuske, MP regarding classification of Bomet County as a COVID-19 hotspot zone. He attended in person and we, he got the response. Unless he has a comment, I don't think uh, I need to go through. That's a member for Chepalungu. Yeah? No, no, no. It is the member for Chebalungu, I recall, who is also a vice chair of a SAM committee. He normally, he normally sits around there, not, not too far away from where the majority of people is sitting. I think that's a member who under, saw the statement. Yeah. Since he's not present and you say he appeared and he appeared to have been satisfied, I think you don't need to to a statement regarding COVID-19 pandemic situation in Homba Bay County and its environs by Honorable Peter Opondo Kaluma, whom I also don't see like he's in the house, Mr. Speaker. He also attended and he, he got the answer. Um, I, unless... Um, well, he, he got the answer from a uh, horse's mouth. Yes. I mean, that is uh, like uh, what you would call, you call in evidence viva voce. Yes. So, having received it uh, directly, yes. uh, maybe that's why he is not present. I he had already we, received the answer. Very well. I think we can put it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's all? Yeah, that's all. Very well. Majority whip. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, on behalf of the Majority Leader, pursuant to the provisions of Standing Order 442A, I rise to give the following statement on behalf of the House Business Committee. Honorable Speaker, let me take this opportunity to welcome members from the short working recess. As members may recall, the House resolved to alter the calendar to extend the recess period by one week to allow committees more time to consider all pending business especially individual members' bills. I hope members found the extra period granted useful to expedite any pending business and also in interact with the constituents. Honorable Speaker, on Tuesday, 10th August 2021, next week, the following business has been tentatively scheduled for consideration. One, the following bills have been scheduled for first reading. A, the Public Service Internship Bill National Assembly Bill Number 25 of 2021 by the Honorable Nesula Lesuda, MP. B, the Asians, Widows and Orphans Pension Repeal Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 29 of 2021 by the Majority Leader. C, the Provident Fund Repeal Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 30 of 2021 by the Majority Leader. Two, the following bills have been scheduled for second reading. A, the Irrigation Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 12 of 2021. B, the Social Assistance Repeal Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 16 of 2020. C, the Landlord and Tenant Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 3 of 2021. Three, in addition, the House is also scheduled to consider Sessional Paper Number 1 of 2021 on the National Water Policy. Honorable Speaker, in accordance with the provisions of Standing Order 42A, 5, and 6, I wish to convey that the following Cabinet Secretaries are scheduled to appear before Departmental Committees as follows. One, the Cabinet Secretary for Devolution and Arid and Semi-Arid Lands will appear on Monday, 9th August 2021, before the Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security to respond to A, question number 221 of 2021, by the Honorable Tom Odege, MP, on the occurrence of the flooding in Yatike. Two, the Cabinet Secretary for Public Service and Gender will appear on Monday, 9th August 2021, before the Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security to respond to one, question number 232 of 2021, by the Honorable Samuel Gashove, MP, regarding the payment processes under the NYS Empowerment Program. Three, the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and Coordination will appear on Monday 9th August 2021 before the Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security to respond to one, question number 193, 193 
of 2 to 1 by the Honorable Alfred Agoy, MP, regarding the measures to control heavy vehicle traffic in highways. B, question number 204 of 2 to 1 by the Honorable Joshua Kimilu, MP, on the occurrence of landslides in Ndu sublocation and the measures the ministry is taking to assist the residents. <coughs> C, question number 224 of 2 to 1 by the Honorable Victor Munyaka, MP, regarding the operational of Kalama Subcounty Administrative Unit. D, question number 249 of 2021 by the Honorable Peris Tobiko, MP, regarding the rampant theft of livestock in Kajaro East. E, question number 227 of 2021, by the Honorable Halima Mushege, MP, regarding the unexplained disappearance of Dennis Kinoti. And F, question number 244 of 2021, by Honorable William Kamket, MP, on the removal of police roadblocks along Marigat, Shemolingot Road in Tiati constituency. And G, question number 203, of 2021 by Honorable Omboko Milemba, MP, regarding the recent incidents of insecurity in Mahaya. Honorable Speaker, the House Business Committee will convene on Tuesday, 10th August 2021 to, co to schedule the business for that week. I now wish to lay this statement on the table of the House. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Very well, next order. Order number eight, motion. Report of the Committee of the Whole House on the Parliamentary Pensions Amendment Number Three Bill, National Assembly Bill Number Fifty Seven of Twenty Nineteen. Question to be put and that reading. Honourable well, members, uh, I put the question, which is that this House do agree with the report of the Committee of the Whole House on its consideration of the Parliamentary Pensions Amendment Bill Number Three Bill. National Assembly Bill Number 57 of 2019. With as many as that opinion say aye. aye. As many of counter opinion say nay. The eyes have it. Yeah. Who's of chair? Yeah. Move. On. <coughs> Honourable Speaker, I, be, I beg to move that the parliamentary pension amendment bill amendment number three bill national assembly bill number 57 of 2019 be now read a third time i also request honorable teddy mombire to second Member for Ganze. mr speaker i do second Honourable members, uh, I propose the question, which is that the Parliamentary Pensions Amendment number, Amendment number 3 Bill, National Assembly Bill number 57 of 2019, be now read a third time. My members, I now put the question, which is that the Parliamentary Pensions Amendment number 3 Bill National Assembly Bill number 57 of 2019 be now read a third time. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? Will as many as of counter opinion say nay? The eyes of it. A bill for an act of parliament to amend the Parliamentary Pensions Act and for connected purposes. Next order. Order number nine, the Work Bill, National Assembly Bill number 73 of 2019. Second reading, question to be put. Honourable members, a debate on this uh, bill was concluded yesterday, and what remained was for the question to be put, which I hereby do. The Work for Bill, National Assembly Bill number 73 of 2019, be now read a second time. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? Aye. As many of the opinion say nay? The eyes of it. A bill for an act of parliament to provide for the establishment of the work commission to provide for the administration of work property and for connected purposes. 
Next one. Order number 10, the National Hospital Insurance Fund Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number 21 of 2021, second reading, resumption of debate. Nobody was on the floor, so all at, uh, at liberty to. The chair of uh, health committee, you have not spoken, eh? Please. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to really support um, the NHIF. Uh, Amendment Bill, the National Assembly Bill number 21 of 2021. Mr. Speaker, and before I give my contribution, I really want to thank all the stakeholders uh, who, after we published on print media on 10th June 2021, requesting for comments on the bill um, from the members of public and relevant stakeholders, pursuant to the provision of Article 118, 1B, we had many stakeholders who uh, came from the Ministry of Health, the National the NHF in, itself, the Kenya Medical Practitioners Board, uh, Dr. Kahora Mundia, the National Gender Equality Commission, Central Organization of Trade Union, Federation of Kenya Employers, British American Insurance Company, Kenya Association of Private Hospitals, and Kenya Union of Nutritionists and Dietitians. Though some uh, others came late, uh, Mr. Speaker, these ones were able to thoroughly go through, and I want to take also this opportunity to thank the members of the committee who burnt the midnight oil to make sure that we were able to handle several amendments that were here and also the amendments um, that we have tabled today. Mr. Speaker, this bill seeks to amend the National Hospital Insurance Fund Act of 1998 to establish a national health scheme and to ensure that the mandate and the capacity of the National Hospital Insurance Fund, which is famously known as the NHIF, will facilitate and deliver the universal health coverage. This is one of the big four agenda. And to the, my colleagues who normally take to the political podiums to say the big four agendas are dead, they need to be in the house at a time like this because I can't see the yellow as I'd seen it before, to know that we are still pursuing and these agendas are so much alive. Mr. Speaker, yeah, please advise them. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the government of Kenya adopted the UHC uh, as one of the big four priority agenda with an aspiration that by 2022, all citizens will have access to quality health care services that they need without getting into financial difficulties. For the government to realize that, uh, and sustain UHC, there is therefore a need for the development and implementation of adequate policy, legal and institutional frameworks, including the transformation and repositioning of the national NHIF as a key driver and a strategic purchase of health care services for Kenyan residents. Among the key recommendations, uh, Mr. Speaker, there is a proposal to reposition NHIF as a key driver for UHC in Kenya in this amendment. The bill proposes one of the concepts that is practiced globally, where the private health insurer, insurance is a primary player, while the social health insurer becomes the second player. This will allow the social insurer to cater for the cost of treatment more comprehensively for the vulnerable population in the society with a limited ability to purchase insurance or even health services. And if they thoroughly go through this, then they can understand what bottom-up means. We are taking care of the vulnerable in the society, and so this is not just uh, theoretical, but we are practicing it in this house, not in the next year. Mr. Speaker, some of the critical amendments that we have done in this bill is to propose that employ, employ, employers match the employee's contribution. This was one of the proposals. However, the committee amended this provision due to the tough COVID times that we have, and this would have really heavily affected the private sector. And we propose that the national and county governments to lead and shall be responsible for paying an equal contribution to NHIF in respect to all public officers and state officers. Further, the private employer shall be obligated to top up the employees' contribution who pay the minimum contribution to NHIF to ensure that the cumulative amount for each employee to the fund is not less than 500 shillings. Just to explain to the House is that um, part of the lower cadre of the employees, because the NHIF, they do calculations per the percentage, we have the lowest paying at 100.
150 shillings and all the way to the maximum of the people who earn more than 100,000 to the both government county and national government to, talk, to actually match the contribution. vision so that if uh, parliament we are limiting our money we are also and we are committed to make sure that it is sustained the committee also proposed reduction of the penalty for non remitters of special contribution by self employed persons from five times to 10% of the amount of contribution due this is necessary so as to ensure a realistic payment of penalties so that we don't, um, sometimes the ones who are not able to pay, it's not that they were not willing. They may not have, not have had the money. And this has happened even to um, even some of our contribution, even in this parliament, when we, our staff will delay the payment. Hence, um, the, the penalties that was given five times was really not um, favorable, especially to the most vulnerable in the community. As to the non-remittance by the contributor, may be occasioned by lack of funds, occasioned by lack of income, the amendment further seeks to eliminate the double penalty for non-remittance. Committee also proposed an amendment to allow for a provision of voluntary contribution to be made by the youth, so as to ensure that any youth who may not have a stable parent, and remember the 500 shillings that is voluntary, it covers both uh, if they are, the both parents are there and the siblings who are below the age of 21. But our young people, even the ones who are in the university, if they would wish to make a contribution, to NHIF, they were, are still forced to pay the 500 shillings. There is no, no consideration of a youth. And as we know, the definition of a youth, anyone who is uh, between the age of 18 and 35, so we have tasked NHIF to come up with an amount and hopefully maybe around 200 shillings where one can pay per month and they'll be able to access to the services. The bill proposes that households with, with the ability to pay must contribute to the kitty. However, for those unable to pay, the national and county governments will step in and pay. Approximately 20% of the 5.1 million poor and vulnerable households have been identified across all the 47 counties. Finally, to reduce the turnaround time in service delivery and deter fraudulent activities, the bill proposes complete digitalization of the NHIF process. So as I, I, I wind up, I, I would want to say I support, and as I thank my colleagues, I want to urge this House, as we debate, we support these amendments, so that the issue of UAT can become a reality. And uh, we have had, had done several NHIF reforms where there was a lot of frauds. Now uh, things are now in order. And we are hopeful that all Kenyans will now finally enjoy UAT services. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Sheikh Mohammed, member for GSL. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I stand to support the amendment that we have considered in the Health Committee uh, on uh, the matter of uh, looking at uh, Bill Number 21 uh, of 2021. And I do support uh, for uh, various reasons, and some of these reasons are quite compelling. Uh, I call them compelling because I see that uh, the cornerstone of society, uh, the cornerstone of uh, the health of communities across the world, it is not a new thing for us. It has been here for many years, uh, particularly NHIF that's been here. Although it used to be called uh, a National Hospital Insurance Fund, it is currently called National Health Insurance Fund. Uh, and if you can look at that particular point, the term health uh, is, is a very important uh, uh, point that can raise uh, the, the situation that it is no longer about hospital. It is about health care. It is about looking at the health of our community, you know, wholesomely, whether be it be physiotherapy, be it be radiotherapy, be it be direct medical intervention and medical admissions in hospitals as well. Therefore, that is the reason as to why it is currently called 
or even psych psychotherapy and, and psychology and, and many other things that are outside the hospital uh, vicinity sometimes uh, that could be utilized in other various institutions that specialize in those particular areas. And therefore, that is the main reason as to why it carries the term health. Uh, and therefore, that gives a prerogative uh, to which that it can stand across various disciplines within the health, health, health service or, or the, the, the health of, of the individual. Now, this bill has gone through was not necessarily individuals that were coming to contribute uh, to the reasoning as to why this amendment is necessary. But it is also about uh, the shoe wearer. The shoe wearer could be the individuals, that particular patient that can utilize that, that doctor that uses this to ensure that the patients are covered, uh, that uh, hospital that will ensure that it has delivered the service and it is paid accordingly. And therefore, we have engaged these public in individuals and private individuals to be able to come and, and tell us that. But NHIF, NHIF for me, uh, I joined on the 24th of March 1993, by the way. And therefore, that is a long time ago. Uh, and that's what my card is showing. That means that uh, this is a service that has been providing services uh, for many years, uh, you know, even way before me. And therefore, to amend, to change, to, to carry on the day, you know, as things change by, is, is very necessary, Mr. Speaker. Now, quality of health care is a universal human right, you know, for one and for all. That is, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 an important thing that is required by everybody across the world. So it is a fundamental human right that we can get uh, access to healthcare service. And therefore, for us to get that, uh, it means that there has to be a funding body, a body that pulls fund to be able to be utilized uh, by individuals that, you know, fall ill and require that service. You know, but the particular reasoning as to why we were making these changes, or, or these amendments rather, uh, is, is because equitable health services uh, must be obtained by everybody if we are looking at the human rights of everyone. And what I mean by that is to say that the poor and the rich can be able to access that pool of fund uh, so that they can utilize that pool of fund at the time of need, at the hour of need, at the period of need for themselves and for their loved ones. And therefore, unless we have got these checks and balances that are put together to ensure that this is universally provided to the poor and the rich equitably, then we will not be able to achieve uh, you know, that universal human right that I have begun my statement with. Mr. Speaker, you know, uh, the point that we really looked at and dug into, and I really argued in my discussions and debates on the time that we were processing these amendments, uh, is that you see there are public workers, and those are the ones that work in public institutions and public governments, uh, I mean government institutions that is. Uh, and, and, and those private workers that work in private industry, you know, in, 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 in the hotel industry, in, in, in various other industries, that is. Uh, these are the two types of workers. Now, if the government is giving a particular amount of money, whether we, be it be the county government, be it be the national government, If it is adding up a particular amount, then why not the private worker's best services? And for an industry worker or a hotel worker uh, to be getting, you know, a, less amount of, uh, a lesser amount of service. You know, what that means is that if someone is given uh, a service of 150,000, equivalent to 150,000 shillings, then, uh, and that is a public worker or someone working for the government, then the one who is working in private should be able to get that, not any less than that. And that is where that uniformity, that universal you know, human right comes in now here. So we say that it must be reaching within that bar. Now, we are also trying to see that this bill repositions NHIF as the driver of UHC. UHC is one of the cornerstones of this government's uh, you know, uh, decision to make sure that uh, uh, healthcare is 
an important element that you know, uh, the, 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 the Uhuru government wants to find that it has left as a legacy. And that is why we want to say, if we strengthen and support the process that NHIF takes to be able to contribute to the healthcare of our society, then it means that we must uh, be able to support this through UHC. And that is why it is important. Although, to my mind, UHC is universal health coverage. For me, I would like to call it UHC, universal health care. And when I say universal health care, and this, I debated so much about it, the word coverage is not very important to me, uh, simply because it has been used. That is why I have to live with it. But I would rather say